Good afternoon. Uh, it is now 3.30 on Wednesday, May 4th. And I'd like to call to order the Public Works Committee of the City of Isle Palms and acknowledge that the press and the public have been duly notified of the meeting in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act. Next on the agenda is the approval of the previous meeting's minutes. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Any additions, deletions, corrections? There being none, all in favor? I second. I second. Okay. Aye. 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 Uh, citizens' comments? There are none. We'll go straight into departmental, departmental reports. All right. <clears throat> Very quickly, uh, month of April, garbage. You can see it's down a little bit. That might be a little bit of timing there. Uh, about par for the course for that month of the year. Um, again, yard debris, a little bit down, but. Uh, that's because I think the island's fairly clean. Well, we're ahead of schedule, uh, up to or ahead of schedule, uh, tr servicing all the subdivisions um, weekly and sometimes twice a week. Um, so we're trying to stay ahead of the game because, as you know, when we go to twice a week garbage, that's when things start to back up. <clears throat> so we hope, hopefully stay on top of it. Uh, 42 tons of miscellaneous was transported to the Palmetto, Palmetto Commerce, uh, which is Ladson. And then the, for me, the vehicle maintenance, we, the maintenance was $4,300. The, really the big item was the, uh, a little bit of welding that we've had done uh, on, a, on the utility vehicle that came from the fire department. Uh, to get that bed back in line, uh, we rebuilt that bed. Uh, so, other than that, any questions for me? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Robert. Good afternoon, just some highlights. Um, drainage, we ordered the tide valves for the 25th. Avenue SCDOT project. Um, I was pleasantly surprised what we had budgeted for that came in way under budget. So those are ordered for that project. Um, on facilities, we've had all the exterior lighting for the PSB sign, changed over to LED lighting. There was a broken electrical box that wasn't addressed with the renovation that was fixed. Um, generally this time of year with a lot of AC repair, um, have public works. We've also had to go into PSB, replace ceiling tiles. Um, and we've also had Public Works replaced parts for the wash station. Front Beach, we've been focusing a lot on litter cleanup. We've had Public Works out there with the utility vehicle that we got from the fire department to clean up the parking lot, Front Beach, um, the compactor. We've had to install irrigation extension for the donated trees to the municipal lot. Um, also installed a fill -a bag post um, at Front Beach. That's um, a partnership that Susan Smith had to pick up debris that is on the beach. Uh, also parking flags at the key kiosks and uh, new cigarette urns at Front Beach. Um, down on 42nd Avenue, we are having the additional 100 feet of Moby map put down. Uh, we also reinstalled, removed and reinstalled the Moby mat at 9th Ave and had to add cedar fencing at the Carmen R. Bunch Park to block the golf cart from diverting off the path. Uh, the compactor we've been focusing on, we've cleaned, we've been cleaning, Public Works has been cleaning the compactor pad in the whole recycling area. Every Thursday we have uh, professional contractor coming in once a month to keep that clean. Also been getting uh, estimates for the gate for the compactor, new rule signs have been put up. Um, and we also have, what we've done is we've had the 
restroom attendant who was down on Saturdays and Sundays, he's monitoring the compactor and cleaning it three times a day, Saturday and Sunday. We will be putting somebody on Friday at the restrooms and then he'll be monitoring that. And that's actually the, just this past weekend, see Donnie and I, we came down here because the compactor, he had called us, compactor was overflowing. Somebody had thrown some debris in there that wouldn't compact, came down. And before we came in on Monday with a mountain, we were able to correct that. And then just the usual meetings. Any question? Yeah. Sure. How much was the, you, you mentioned that the uh, the valves for the uh, 25th Avenue project came in under what you thought they were, how, what was the? Yeah, they came in under, it was 22,000 we saved. Okay, out so, of, what, 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 I forgot, we just approved that, but what was the amount that you anticipated? 70, 76? Five, yeah, okay, 70. That was, that was okay, so it was like two thirds of the cost. Yeah, yeah. so it was really surprised. Yeah, that's that. good. Have you got any uh, feedback from your dumpster work from, uh, the dinghy and so and what you've been I, your change to the cleanup process yeah so also with this and it wasn't included in the report is i had an exterminator come down to kind of assess the whole area mm -hmm. um there was quite a few things and i shared that report with brett with the city um desiree and douglas um we have all the bait stations for the rat traps have been replaced um set around the whole area um, there were some recommendations that I sent over to Brett and Brett said, you know, he would, you know, accommodate whatever we had to do down there. So I don't know the results yet, um, but I feel if we do as much as we possibly can engage it, yeah. see where we are, um, you know, then we'll see how it, how it works. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. We've got an old business. And item A is updated on phase three drainage. So the contractor is has been on site this week. Um, their first line of work is going to be across the golf course at um, at 30th and Waterway. That was kind of first on their schedule. That's being done this month to accommodate a little bit slower season for the golf course at Wild Dunes request. Uh, so that, that project is uh, proceeding as we expected uh, with the exception of the, the detour. They have, they, we have been trying to kind of negotiate as short of a detour as we can. Um, and there's a little bit of unknown about the need to detour traffic to replace the there's there are water lines and sewer lines right at the edge of the asphalt and and some of that detour is going to be necessary uh, because of the size of the excavation that needs to happen immediately adjacent to the asphalt i don't think that we fully anticipated that i think we we expected it to be kind of a 10 day two week thing they have come back and say oh no we need like six weeks um, so we're, we're trying to work with the contractor to get that detour um, as short as it can possibly be. Uh, and we're gonna meet, we're meeting, um, I, think, I think next Wednesday about it. So that's kind of our primary concern at this point. Um, Where's the detour going to be though? Uh, right at 30th. So yeah, the road so would be, so you would go, it would send you down 29th, all the way down 29th. I think all the way to Palm and then Palm up and then Four back hours. up. Uh, well, if, if you had to go, if you had to go to kind of 33rd, it would be uh, either down, down Palm or back up 32nd. So it would just be the one block, but it's a long kind of detour around to get to that block. Um, so it, it kind of, you know, it's a little bit, it is in their kind of OSHA standards give them a set distance that these trenching boxes need to be and, and clear safe distances away from that. So we're a little bit of, of the mercy of um, those standards of what's safe. We just feel like anything they can do to tighten up the schedule for that work and not kind of create a big hole and then let it sit unattended and, and not being actively worked on for 10 days straight while we're detouring. We're also talking about if it could be done in such a way that they could 
make the excavation. They're not going to, their plan is not to work uh, on weekends. So fill in as much as they can, put steel plates over, open it back up. So those are the kind of things that we're trying to work through the, uh, with a contractor to minimize the impact of those detours. So that's the four uh, kind of on the forefront of, of our minds, those detours. Other things that are um, underway, the um, project, we are trying to um, get an award for the portion of the work at 41st Avenue. We have a grant application in. Um, we're trying to modify that request to include piping the ditch from waterway, from the intersection of waterway and 41st up to the marina property to kind of create additional parking space there. Um, that seems to be a workable plan. It sounds like the granting, uh, the grant organizations are supportive of that. So we need to make modifications to do those modifications. We will have to have the plans and the permits modified, which is gonna require a little bit of additional expense with the engineering firm. So we're expecting proposals to get that work done. When we get those, we'll bring those back for your consideration. We think it's, we think we're understanding that the work is about a half a million dollars of the work that we believe will probably be able to get done with grant money. So we feel like the timing is right to get a good return on um, the project. So we hope to be bringing that forward to you um, soon. Um, it's all I can think of on phase three, unless you have any questions. Any questions? Thank you for that report. Item B is update and consideration of proposals for the installation of improvements to golf cart paths along Ocean Park Plaza and intersection improvements at Ocean Boulevard and J.C. Long Boulevard. Um, so the agenda says consideration, but you all have, this has been uh, already authorized there. Um, all three of these projects, there are three there, right? Um, they have been, the contractor has been, those uh, contracts have been, executed, they're, they're underway and in the contractor's hands to be scheduled. We did hear back from the Ocean Park Plaza project. Robert, did you get, it was, it's very soon. It's like next 14th or 15th of May, right? Yeah, so that one we expect, they said it would be a quick project. Um, so that would be maybe end of next week, maybe the week after that. Um, we have a pre-construction meeting set for the other one. We don't know exactly when that one will happen, um, but we felt we felt we feel like the at least the one right there at Ocean Park Plaza will get done in short order. Very good. I'm glad to hear it. Any comments, questions? No. Okay, we'll move on. This is pretty much been discussed, but I don't know if there's anything else to add. But for uh, the sake of the agenda, I'll just read it out and if there's any comments. It's I received discussion request from the Digny to relocate the existing compactor located at small municipal parking lot. Robert gave us a detailed report. Anything to add? Douglas? No, just that we're, we are, um, you, you got in your packet a, a drawing of where, where the compact, if it were to be moved, kind of the impact it would have on the site. We do think it would, we don't think it could be done without a, a elimination of some parking spaces, exactly how many we don't know. Um, so we've kind of we've kind of looked at it. We do think there's gonna be some impact of, to the parking if we were to do it. We also have what we, what the staff believes is a reasonable approach to trying um, in the, in the near term of, and that's primarily just a, a more rigorous cleaning um, regimen. And probably the biggest, the biggest item in there is the, is building a cinder block wall. I think that comes at the, uh, at, as a recommendation from the exterminator that that would go a long way to, to contain uh, and to, to stop the traffic back and forth. I think that, 
to build that wall would be a, a pretty hefty expense. I think that from the staff's perspective, we wanna try exterminators cleaning um, and at least get a sense of whether or not, you know, what we can do, can we make it a, a good workable solution for the area? And then if, if it looks like we can do it, then I think we would take on the expense uh, of building the wall around it. But at that point, if it looks like kind of no matter what we do, we're gonna have a problem with smell and rodents, then I think we would look closer at the uh, option of, of moving it. But this would be a first, um, a first attempt at getting the issues there better under control than they are now. Very good. Um, any comments? Yes, sir. Is Mr. Jones on board with the city's approach? You all, have uh, you, I know that Donnie, you've met with him um, directly. Has he indicated that he supports it, doesn't support it? Or yeah, he's, he's okay with anything we can do. Uh, and I did have a conversation uh, you know, uh, possibility that the compact could be moved maybe 15 or 20 feet just forward. He was made to eliminate the one parking place where the Charleston County dumpster is now, but we have to relocate that one dumpster. But let's try what the first approach, baby steps. One is to get it clean, keep it clean, keep it maintained, and then we'll see if uh, keep the same basic platform, eliminate the, the uh, vehicle uh, ramp. Vehicle ramp, but that would require council just to know that Problem on the beach where the vehicle has to go out there and get garbage that taxpayers, not accommodations and hospitality, would pay for one or two dumps into a pack. That's the difference. That's why that vehicle ramp was there was years ago, Jimmy. That uh, you know the vehicle used to have to go pick up all the barrels. Yeah, I remember. In house. Yeah. So that garbage was dumped into the compactor as opposed to into a pack. <clears throat> Isn't another problem down there on um, with the grease traps from the restaurants? The tack team. That's that's an additional problem that um, that's they really need to address that, correct? Yes. That's an individual entity that has that. Correct. Great. Well, thank you for reporting. Comments? We'd like to keep, I want to keep this on the agenda and just an update on, uh, I appreciate everybody's efforts of trying to clean that up down there. And now we're going to move on to new business. Presentation of status update of phase four drainage, comprehensive master plan by Davis Floyd. So I'll just quickly introduce uh, Ryan and Aaron with Davis and Floyd. And I would tell you that we have probably been working maybe six months, four or five months, six months with them. They have done a lot of work, uh, and I think they are to a point, they're getting close to a point where the analysis is basically, I think, done. Uh, and they kind of, we've been talking here in our most recent meetings about um, possible solutions to the problems that they're finding. So we thought it was a good point in the process to have them give you a, a status update, kind of show you what they've been working on, uh, and, and kind of make you aware of the next steps in this in this process. So with that, Ryan, Aaron, I'll let you. It'll be go. short. We won't put you to sleep, but um, I'm just going to start out on high level stuff and then pass it off to Aaron and then get a little more details. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Again, I know everyone's probably familiar with the different phases, uh, one, two, three, and four. So right now, kind of the main goal was Phase four overall master plan from field work, what's in what's in the ground to water solutions. And then the second kind of piece of the project was as a whole, look at each phase one, two, three, and four from the development perspective, from the zoning perspective, and upper, other opportunities just to do some easy, quick fixes, save some money, and kind of holistically address drainage. Next slide. 
So again, the, the first piece is part one, that's phase four, drainage master plan. That's mostly what we're going to cover today. That's, that's been the focus. We have looked at some of the maintenance that EDs and others have been working on throughout the island. So we've kind of been working a little bit with Robert and Douglas on that. But again, kind of the big focus has been on the phase four area, looking at what we can do to address drainage. And just quickly today, we're going to cover where we are. We've completed survey. Um, we've put in some monitoring stations to actually collect rainfall, tide levels over by the marina. And then we've actually got some in some manholes. And then we've been able to actually quantify some of the flooding and talk with Robert and them on does it make sense or are the computers smart? Are we dumb and don't know how to operate the computers? And then most importantly, how can we fix the problem? So next slide. You can keep going. So again, the first piece we were given, Charleston County a number of years ago, did some preliminary mapping for the phase four area. So we started with that, but then what we ended up doing is really going out. We did a full inventory on all of the infrastructure. So every bit of drainage that we could physically touch or access, we've inspected, we've documented that, we've collected the survey data. We've given that all to Robert and Douglas. So y'all can actually incorporate that in your <coughs> current databases. So that's invert elevations, pipe sizes, materials, conditions. And really with that, what we've been able to do is start Robert and his group on what are immediate maintenance um, priorities. And so there were a lot of places we couldn't get access or places where manholes were paved over, um, places where there were crushed pipes that we're trying to figure out how we can work with DOT to uh, mitigate those problems. But that's, that's what we've been able to do with that data so far is to say, here's, here's some maintenance issues that we can go ahead and address maybe with ED support. So um, that was a good, good first stab. And if you go to the next slide, um, we, we've already given Robert this. This is just an example showing um, some of the level of detail that we've collected. We've given them hard copies. Um, we've given them some Google Earth files. They're just easy for just general residents that may want to see things. And then again, we've got all this GIS to be able to incorporate into the city's databases. So next slide. So like Ryan was like what Ryan was talking about, we've been at, able to actually go out and install monitoring stations. Um, throughout the city, we've got um, the next slide, please. And you can just click a few times. I put in some animations. So um, would you mind um, using the mic so uh, we yeah. can have this recorded, please? Thank you. Yeah, let me uh, scoop forward a little bit so I can see what I'm looking at. <laughs> So we've got three monitoring stations installed throughout the city. And really what this is helping us do is quantify existing conditions. So we're looking at water level and rainfall and things that are going to con um, contribute to flooding or exacerbate existing conditions. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to, you know, tweak our engineering assumptions, tweak our models, and really start to um, fine tune and calibrate a lot of these decisions for the city that um, you know, one makes a lot more sense, and two, um, by using this hyper-localized data, we're able to make better, more informed decisions in the long run. You know, when you go to the doctor's office, they want to run a bunch of tests, they just don't start prescribing you medication, and that's what we're doing here. So we've got one down on Ocean Boulevard um, near the 2nd Avenue beach access that's actually placed in a manhole um, that is measuring water level within the network. Really what that's uh, been able to teach us is how far tidal water um, works its way into the stormwater network and reduces overall system capacity so that we account for that in any decisions that we make. Um, we've got one over at the county park on that stormwater pond, just also measuring water level. And that's also to help us um, fine tune our models and look at stormwater runoff and rates and, you know, try to eliminate as many of those engineering assumptions as possible. And then we've got one of our main stations back at the marina, and that's measuring tidewater level and rainfall. 
And that's really to help us have real data to look at the tidal influence in a lot of these networks. Um, if you hit the next slide, please. And this is just an example of what that data looks like. We collect all of it in real time and remotely. Um, these levels are in uh, topographic elevation. Um, so what you can really see is um, during that first high tide cycle, the dark blue line is um, tide. The red line is um, our water level within that manhole. And then the purple line is the water level in the county park. Um, really, you can see that impact of the high tide coming in and moving water into the network and reducing capacity. And then you can also see how the network or how some key spots start to respond to rainfall, which is represented by those inverted bars up top. Um, could you hit the next slide, please? And so really what we've been able to use all of this data for, the field collection, the monitoring stations, we're able to go in and make a hydrologic and hydraulic model. Um, this is just a screenshot of the, the quote unquote one dimensional portion of that. That's just us looking at how water is moving to the pipes and how water is getting to the pipes. But really where, what we're able to do with this is, if you hit the next slide, please, is we're able to actually go in and start to do what we call two-dimensional modeling, which is where we actually look at, um, we're able to model a variety of scenarios and look at you know, what areas are flooding and where that water is coming in, how long is it staying there? Um, so really being able to look at flood depth and duration in order to start to pick out what types of flooding are occurring and how can we possibly fix them? And a lot of these areas we have um, taken to Robert and Douglas and confirmed that, like Ryan said, that you know we are modeling these areas correctly and these are problem areas. So if you hit the next slide, please. So after we complete that modeling, we're able to um, export that data and look at flood depth and duration to highlight out significant areas of flooding. Um, for our high priority areas or what we have delineated as high priority, we're using the criteria of flooding for uh, more than 30 minutes at a depth greater than six inches. That doesn't mean that we won't be looking at other areas of flooding. It's just these are the areas that we have delineated as high priority or areas that we should start looking at conceptual designs first. So if you hit the next slide and then just go ahead and click a couple times. Um, so, so far we have uh, identified eight locations um, across the phase four study area uh, that have air, that are areas of significant flooding. The first is the neighborhood at Palm Boulevard and Carolina Boulevard. What we've primarily found to be the problem in that area is, as a lot of us know, it's a very low elevation neighborhood. A lot of those houses sit in a bowl. Um, so what happens is storm surge is actually the primary factor, um, which is increasing flooding in that area. And water is actually working its way back through the stormwater network to help fill up part of that bowl and reduce system capacity quite significantly. Um, we have a problem area at 2nd Avenue and Charleston Boulevard that's actually due primarily to a crushed pipe um, connecting the Charleston Boulevard network to the 2nd Avenue drainage network. So we're looking at scenarios where we replace that pipe or put in a new drainage network to cut to connect it back and drain all the way out to second avenue in addition to potentially adding a tide gate to prevent a lot of that tidal backflow um, we've identified fourth avenue and palm boulevard that is another um, depressional sink where it's very very low elevation and the issue with this system is that the pipes are actually inversely sloped the water has to work its way uphill pretty significantly in order to get out. Um, so we're looking at a number of solutions for that to try to solve any flooding that may go across Palm Boulevard, which would um, inhibit a lot of significant traffic during some of these extreme events. We've also identified some areas uh, along between 6th and 7th Avenue along Ocean Boulevard. Um, primarily the issue with that is that there is no existing drainage infrastructure. And the way that the landscape is um, 
the way that the landscape is in that area is that it actually creates a bowl where all of the water drains down to about six and ocean and sits there for a while. Um, and then the rest of these are all pretty similar issues. Um, these last four areas, which is 19th Avenue, Myrtle, 21st and Waterway, 25th and Waterway, and then Driftwood Lane and Waterway. These are all areas um, where flooding occurs during significant storm surges from tidal influence working its way back into the stormwater network, um, spilling out of inlets or grates, or just um, coming in over the low-lying elevation and flooding the surrounding landscape. So if you can hit the next slide, please. Can I just ask a question? For yeah. For you? So those are those the you know, only areas that you identified through your modeling that fit your high priority criteria? Yes. Um, we had one more um, that we're playing around with actually at 9th Avenue and Ocean Boulevard that we've spoken with um, Douglas and Robert about, but these are the ones, these are the preliminary spots where we're starting. So while I don't want to go through um, each of these eight spots, I thought it might be good to highlight some of the conceptual designs that we're looking at for two of these locations. So the first one is the area up on uh, 25th Avenue and Waterway Boulevard. Um, what our modeling has shown and what our conversations with Robert and Douglas um, have confirmed is that during king tide events or during storm surge events, a lot of tidal flooding occurs, um, flooding out the road at the top of 25th Avenue. So what we've proposed is if you um, just, you can hit twice real quick. We proposed an earth embankment along the northwestern side behind the houses on 25th Avenue, and that's to prevent tidal um, influence from spilling over and actually flooding out the road. We found that a pretty small earth embankment at that location would actually hold back a lot of the um, tidal waters, even during an extreme event. Um, these are actually using um, these two modeling results are actually from an extreme event, aka Hurricane Matthews um, tidal cycle. And we also recommended a tide gate, which um, Robert has actually already purchased to prevent that tidal backflow. If you hit that next slide, just so we can, you know, as we all know, keep the stormwater leaving and then prevent the um, tidal backflow from inundating the entire system and spilling out onto the street when you have. Um, very significant tide cycles during a key tide or a storm surge event. Can you hit the next slide, please? The other area I wanted to highlight was the area between 6th and 7th Avenue along Ocean Boulevard, where there is no existing drainage infrastructure. Um, to solve this issue, um, what we've, we've tried to think a little bit outside the box, tried to save the uh, city a little bit of money while also solving the problem. And what we've come up um, conceptually with so far and um, what our models are showing will work is if you hit the um, next two real quick. We've looked at putting in a collection system on either side of Ocean Boulevard to actually drain to what's called a dune infiltration system along the beach access uh, at 6th and 7th Avenue. What these systems are, if you can click one more time, is the, they are underground chambers um, where we route all of the stormwater runoff to, to both provide temporary storage for, and then allow that water to infiltrate into the surrounding soil. And the reason why um, we wanna put that along the beach access um, back in the dunes and be covered up by sand is that those dunes will provide a very high capacity for infiltrating that water into the surrounding soil to actually keep up with even very extreme events and prevent water from backing up onto the road and staying there for several hours to a day. If you hit the next slide. Yeah. How, how deep in the dunes would they be buried? Um, so the ones we have sized out right now, which um, moving forward, we're gonna be working with the manufacturer to try to get exact CAD files and pricing for the city. Um, they are, 60 inches tall. Um, so in the with the current elevation of the dune systems, they would be bare, the bottom of it would be buried about five feet below. And then they would be covered up with sand and you could put a boardwalk on top of it to help cover it up um, and keep it out of the public eye. Yeah, does, uh, 
too is to be, to be very dynamic. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Aaron, did I see that it, it when um, Jimmy is referencing the dunes, it looked like it wasn't going back even as far as the houses there are from that sketch? Would it be truly? Can you back up a little bit? Like back in what I think we all call the dunes, which is like back at the ocean's edge, or would it be kind of next to the house? It would be a next to the beach access. So in the sketch, um, I was trying to um, stay within the bounds of the right of way of the beach access. That sketch doesn't lay it out perfectly where that is, but it would run um, what we have sketched out right now and what we think would work would be three um, series of chambers along right off of the beach access that would stay within the city's right of way. Does um, it go kind of seaward of a house or mm -hmm. is it closer to the roadside of the access? It goes seaward. So, the house. yeah. Okay. Um, is it perpendicular to the beach access or is it parallel? Parallel, yeah. It, it'd be about 100 feet. We're kind of looking like a 100 foot length and the depth. So they, they do make various depth configurations depending on where the water table is, other things like that. And so this is very preliminary and we did we were able to get some of the geotechnical data from phase three and it looks like it, you know, will be a feasible alternative versus you know the, the other alternative will be do nothing or you know you could try to route all of that flow north across the entire island and then rip mm -hmm. up lots of roads. So we, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to get yeah. too specific and for the engineering guys, but yeah, um, I understand that. Thank you. Does yeah. that graphic make it look like it does not go as close to the ocean as the existing houses are? That would be correct. Um, I think, like Ryan was talking about, we're looking at about a um, hundred to depending on how how significant you want to make the system 100 to about 180 foot lengths of these chambers. Um, so I was spacing it out to keep it behind the uh, most ocean facing part of that property on the right there. Um, I'd have to double check it in uh, Google Maps real quick to double check, but it shouldn't ex it won't extend out into that primary dune system where the beach is located. It, yep. should, it should stay with next to the beach access. There would be concern if though, from my standpoint, if they were going seaward of the houses, mm -hmm. you know, in those areas, you do get the erosion, not up to the back of the house, but we wouldn't want them seaward of the house to a point where uh, a beach event, I mean, a storm event kind of washes it out. But I think if they were no farther back than the houses, I wouldn't expect they would have. I don't think there are any, any further seaward seaward than any of our models. Not with you, though. That there was no danger. Has this been tried in other beach community in the state? State of South Carolina, no. Uh, NC State did a pilot program where they tested out this type of technology, and if they've been doing it up in northern uh, North Carolina. Um, Causewell Beach just put one in. They actually got DOT to pay for it. And um, same company, Storm Tech, is ADS. Uh, a lot of your plastic pipe and stuff like this is who the vendor is. So that's who we're working with. And we we did actually Home Depot in Mount Pleasant. We did the drainage on that project. So actually underneath all the parking lot is the same type of technology. So um, we haven't used it in South Carolina just because of permitting challenges, but we're hoping uh, you know, Alpine might be a good first case. So instead of putting in new piping, good thing too is it filters out, you know, contaminants and things like that. So instead of taking all that gasoline and oil and dumping it in the waterway, you just infiltrate it. Is there a, an idea on cost? For the chamber itself, um, with the price of resin right now is probably half a million dollars or so um, to cover about 500 feet by 40 feet. So that's kind of the chamber price and it's mainly because of the plastic and all the resin coming from China. 
but our next step is to get with ADS, we've actually reached out to them, get them to come up with an actual layout and design so we can kind of work with the city and then work with some local contractors like Banks Construction or something to get some pricing on what it would cost to build. So. Well, would the plan be to install that in every beach access path or just those areas that are low enough with? Just areas that are isolated that do not have any drainage mm -hmm. that have have a lot of issues. Yeah. So the only other location on the island we're looking at potentially recommending or installing these systems would be along Ninth Avenue or the Ninth Avenue Beach Access, since that's an area that Robert and Douglas have identified as an area of significant significant flooding or nuisance flooding to us. Mm -hmm. um, but the rest of the island seems to have access to you know, substantial drainage infrastructure. All right, right. Are you done? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we should say the end. Well, I had a question. I had a question slide at the end. <laughs> I, I do have one question. In your yeah. monitoring that you did on, uh, particularly in the marina, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, if you, I don't know if you have any historical data, but have you seen any sea level rise uh, from that? Um, not yet, because we've only been installed um, at the marina for six months now. But sea level rise is something that we are planning on accounting for in our modeling and in our design recommendations. And it's also why we're um, basing a lot of our design recommendations off some of these more extreme events like Hurricane Matthew or other similar caliber events. Okay. Uh, I think in the in our request of them, we asked that they, you know, kind of account for some amount, some kind of broadly acceptable, not a severe uh, trend, but some some amount of sea level rise. Yeah, that'd be correct. And when do you think that your your study is going to be complete? That you can come back to the city with formal recommendations for this. Per the schedule, I think this part is early uh, fall. Mm -hmm. I'll have to check the exact dates. Um, but I feel like we're moving along on schedule. Uh, really, the, the next part is cost estimating. And we, we still want to look at some of the areas that do, you know, we're looking at half an hour, six inches. Um, above that is kind of critical, but we still want to go back and look at other portions so that y'all could have some shovel ready recommendations. So you know, okay. if money comes available, hey, do we have a project we can do? Can we, can we address some drainage here or there? So we do want to allow y'all to have that, that option. Yeah, that would encourage that. Very good. Thank you very much. Very Thank you. Important. Thank you. Our miscellaneous business the next meeting date will be 3 30 p.m. on June 8th. And, uh, we never have a second session. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.